Story nine of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine This Majestic Lie Part one In the twilight a great crowd was streaming up the Prado in Havana. The people had been down to the shore to laugh and twiddle their fingers at the American blockading fleet mere colorless shapes on the edge of the sea. Gorgeous challenges had been issued to the far-away ships by little children and women, while the men laughed. Havana was happy, for it was known that the illustrious sailor Don Patricio de Montojo had with his fleet met the decaying ships of one Dewey and smitten them into stuffing for a baby's pillow. Of course, the American sailors were drunk at the time, but the American sailors were always drunk. Newsboys galloped among the crowd, crying, La Lucha and La Marina. The papers said, This is as we foretold. How could it be otherwise when the cowardly Yankees met our brave sailors? But the tongues of the exuberant people ran more at large. One man said in a loud voice, how unfortunate it is that we still have to buy meat in Havana when so much pork is floating in Manila Bay. Amid the consequent laughter, another man retorted, Oh, never mind, that pork in Manila is rotten, it always was rotten. Still another man said, But, little friend, it would make good manure for our fields if only we had it. And still another man said, Ah, wait until our soldiers get with the wives of the Americans, and there will be many little Yankees to serve hot on our tables. The men of the Maine simply made our appetites good. Never mind the pork in Manila, there will be plenty. Women laughed, children laughed, because their mothers laughed, everybody laughed, and, a word with you, these people were cackling and chuckling and insulting their own dead, their own dead men of Spain, for if the poor green corpses floated then in Manila Bay, they were not American corpses. The newsboys came charging with an extra. The inhabitants of Philadelphia had fled to the forests because of a Spanish bombardment, and also Boston was besieged by the Apaches, who had totally invested the town. The Apache artillery had proven singularly effective, and an American garrison had been unable to face it. In Chicago, millionaires were giving away their palaces for two or three loaves of bread. These dispatches were from Madrid, and every word was truth, but they added little to the enthusiasm, because the crowd, God help mankind, was greatly occupied with visions of Yankee pork floating in Manila Bay. This will be thought to be embittered writing. Very well, the writer admits its untruthfulness in one particular. It is untruthful in that it fails to reproduce one hundredth part of the grossness and indecency of popular expression in Havana up to the time when the people knew they were beaten. There were no lights on the Prado or in the streets because of a military order. In the slow-moving crowd there was a young man and an old woman. Suddenly the young man laughed a strange metallic laugh, and spoke in English, not cautiously. That's damned hard to listen to. The woman spoke quickly. Hush, you little idiot! Do you want to be walking across the grass plot in cabanas with your arms tied behind you? Then she murmured sadly, Johnny, I wonder if that's true, what they say about Manila. I don't know, said Johnny, but I think they're lying. As they crossed the plaza, they could see that the Café Tajon was crowded with Spanish officers in blue and white pajama uniforms. Wine and brandy were being wildly consumed in honor of the victory at Manila. Let's hear what they say, said Johnny to his companion, and they moved across the street and in under the portales. The owner of the Café Tacon 
was standing on a table making a speech amid cheers. He was advocating the crucifixion of such Americans as fell into Spanish hands, and it was all very sweet and white and tender, but above all it was chivalrous, because it is well known that the Spaniards are a chivalrous people. It has been remarked, both by the English newspapers and by the bulls that are bred for the Red Death and secretly the corpses in manila bay mocked this jubilee the mocking mocking corpses in manila bay to be blunt johnny was an american spy once he had been the manager of a sugar plantation in pinar del rio and during the insurrection it had been his distinguished function to pay tribute money food and forage alike to spanish columns and insurgent bands he was performing this straddle with benefit to his crops and with mildew to his conscience when spain and the united states agreed to skirmish both in the name of honour it then became a military necessity that he should change his base whatever of the province that was still alive was sorry to see him go for he had been a very dexterous man and food and wine had been in his house even when a man with a mango could gain the envy of an entire spanish battalion without doubt he had been a mere trimmer but it was because of his crop and he always wrote the words thus c r o p in those days a man of peace and commerce was in a position parallel to the watchmaker who essayed a task in the midst of a drunken brawl with oaths bottles and bullets flying about his intent bowed head so many of them or all of them were trimmers and to any armed force they fervently said god assist you and behold the trimmers dwelt safely in a tumultuous land and without effort save that their little machines for trimming ran night and day so many a plantation became covered with a maze of lies as if thick webbing spiders had run from stalk to stalk in the cane so sometimes a planter incurred an equal hatred from both sides and when in trouble there was no camp to which he could flee save straight in the air the camp of the heavenly host if johnny had not had a crop he would have been plainly on the side of the insurgents but his crop staked him down to the soil at a point where the spaniards could always be sure of finding him him or his crop it is the same thing but when war came between spain and the united states he could no longer be the cleverest trimmer in pinar del rio and he retreated upon key west losing much of his baggage train not because of panic but because of wisdom in key west he was no longer the manager of a big cuban plantation he was a little tan-faced refugee without much money mainly he listened there was naught else to do in the first place he was a young man of extremely slow speech and in the key west hotel tongues ran like pinwheels if he had projected his methodic way of thought and speech upon this hurricane he would have been as effective as the man who tries to smoke against the gale this truth did not impress him really he was impressed with the fact that although he knew much of cuba he could not talk so rapidly and wisely of it as many war correspondents who had not yet seen the island usually he brooded in silence over a bottle of beer and the loss of his crop he received no sympathy although there was a plenitude of tender souls war's first step is to make expectation so high that all present things are fogged and darkened in a tense wonder of the future none cared about the collapse of johnny's plantation when all were thinking of the probable collapse of cities and fleets in the meantime battleships monitors cruisers gunboats and torpedo craft arrived departed arrived departed rumors sang about the ears of warships hurriedly coaling and rumors sang about the ears of warships leisurely coming to anchor this happened and that happened and if the news arrived at key west as a mouse it was often enough cabled north as an elephant 
the correspondents at Key West were perfectly capable of adjusting their perspective, but many of the editors in the United States were like deaf men at whom one has to roar. A few quiet words of information was not enough for them. One had to bawl into their ears a whirlwind tale of heroism, blood, death, victory, or defeat, at any rate a tragedy. The papers should have sent playwrights to the first part of the war. Playwrights are allowed to lower the curtain from time to time, and say to the crowd, Mark ye now, three or four months are supposed to elapse, but the poor devils at Key West were obliged to keep the curtain up all the time. This isn't a continuous performance. Yes, it is. It's got to be a continuous performance. The welfare of the paper demands it. The people want news. Very well. Continuous performance. It is strange how men of sense can go aslant at the bidding of other men of sense, and combine to contribute to a general mess of exaggeration and bombast. But we did, and in the midst of the furor I remember the still figure of Johnny, the planter, the ex-trimmer. He looked dazed. This was in May. We all liked him. From time to time some of us heard in his words the vibrant of a thoughtful experience. But it could not be well heard. It was only like the sound of a bell from under the floor. We were too busy with our own clatter. He was taciturn and competent, while we solved the war in a babble of tongues. Soon we went about our peaceful paths, saying ironically one to another, War is hell! Meanwhile, managing editors fought us tooth and nail, and we all were sent boxes of medals inscribed incompetency. We became furious with ourselves. Why couldn't we send hair-raising dispatches? Why couldn't we inflame the wires? All this we did. If a first-class armored cruiser, which had once been a towboat, fired a six-pounder shot from her forward thirteen-inch gun turret, the world heard of it, you bet. We were not idle men. We had come to report the war, and we did it. Our good names and our salaries depended upon it, and we were urged by our managing editors to remember that the American people were a collection of super-nervous idiots who would immediately have convulsions if we did not throw them some news, any news. It was not true at all. The American people were anxious for things decisive to happen. They were not anxious to be lulled to satisfaction with a drug but we lulled them. We told them this and we told them that, and I warrant you our screaming sounded like the noise of a lot of seabirds settling for the night among the black crags. In the meantime Johnny stared and meditated. In his unhurried, unstartled manner he was singularly like another man who was flying the pennant as commander-in-chief of the North Atlantic Squadron. Johnny was a refugee the admiral was an admiral. And yet they were much akin, these two. Their brother was the strategy board, the only capable political institution of the war. At Key West the naval officers spoke of their business and were devoted to it, and were bound to succeed in it. But when the flagship was in port, the only two people who were independent and sane were the admiral and Johnny. The rest of us were lulling the public with drugs. There was much discussion of the new batteries at Havana. Johnny was a typical American. In Europe a typical American is a man with a hard eye, chin whiskers, and a habit of speaking through his nose. Johnny was a young man of great energy, ready to accomplish a colossal thing for the basic reason that he was ignorant of its magnitude. In fact, he attacked all obstacles in life in a spirit of contempt, seeing them smaller than they were until he had actually surmounted them, when he was likely to be immensely pleased with himself. Somewhere in him there was a sentimental tenderness, but it was like a light seen afar at night. It came, went, appeared again in a new place, flickered, flared, went out, left you in a void and angry. 
and if his sentimental tenderness was a light, the darkness in which it puzzled you was his irony of soul. This irony was directed first at himself, then at you, then at the nation and the flag, then at God. It was a midnight in which you searched for the little elusive, ashamed spark of tender sentiment. Sometimes you thought this was all pretext, the manner and the way of fear of the wit of others. Sometimes you thought he was a hardened savage. Usually you did not think, but waited, in the cheerful certainty that in time the little flare of light would appear in the gloom. Johnny decided that he would go and spy upon the fortifications of Havana. If any one wished to know of those batteries, it was the admiral of the squadron, but the admiral of the squadron knew much. I feel sure that he knew the size and position of every gun. To be sure, new guns might be mounted at any time, but they would not be big guns, and doubtless he lacked in his cabin less information than would be worth a man's life. Still, Johnny decided to be a spy. He would go and look. We of the newspapers penned him fast to the tail of our kite, and he was taken to see the admiral. I judged that the admiral did not display much interest in the plan, but at any rate it seemed that he touched Johnny smartly enough with a brush to make him, officially, a spy. Then Johnny bowed and left the cabin. There was no other machinery. If Johnny was to end his life and leave a little book about it, no one cared, least of all Johnny and the Admiral. When he came aboard the tug, he displayed his usual stalwart and rather selfish zest for fried eggs. It was all some kind of an ordinary matter. It was done every day. It was the business of packing pork, sewing shoes, binding hay. It was commonplace. No one could adjust it get it in proportion until afterwards. On a dark night they heaved him into a small boat and rowed him to the beach. And one day he appeared at the door of a little lodging-house in Havana, kept by Martha Clancy, born in Ireland, bred in New York, fifteen years married to a Spanish captain, and now a widow, keeping Cuban lodgers who had no money with which to pay her. She opened the door only a little way, and looked down over her spectacles at him. "'Good morning, Martha,' he said. She looked a moment in silence. Then she made an indescribable gesture of weariness. "'Come in,' she said. He stepped inside. "'And in God's name couldn't you keep your neck out of this rope? And so you had to come here, did you, to Havana?' Upon my soul, Johnny, my son, you are the biggest fool on two legs. He moved past her into the courtyard and took his old chair at the table, between the winding stairway and the door, near the orange tree. Why am I? he demanded stoutly. She made no reply until she had taken seat in her rocking chair and puffed several times upon a cigarette. Then, through the smoke, she said meditatively, "'Everybody knows you are a damned little mumby. Sometimes she spoke with an Irish accent. He laughed. "'I'm no more of a mumby than you are, anyhow. "'I'm no mumby, but your name is poison to half the Spaniards in Havana. "'That you know. "'And if you were once safe in Cayo Hueso, "'tis nobody but a born fool who would come blundering into Havana again. "'Have you had your dinner? "'What have you got?' he asked before committing himself. She arose and spoke without confidence as she moved toward the cupboard. Oh, there's some codfish salad. What? said he. Codfish salad. Codfish what? Codfish salad. Ain't it good enough for you? Maybe this is Delmonico's. No. Maybe ye never heard that the Yankees have us blockaded, eh? Huh? Maybe you think food can be picked in the streets here now, eh? Huh? I'll tell you one thing, my son, if you stay here long, you'll see the want of it, and so you had best not throw it over your shoulder. The spy settled determinedly in his chair, and delivered himself his final decision. That may be true, but I'm damned if I eat codfish salad. Old Martha was a picture of quaint despair. You'll not? No. 
Then," she sighed piously, "may the Lord have mercy on ye, Johnnie, for you'll never do here. 'Tis not the time for you. You're due after the blockade. Will you do me the favour of translating why you won't eat codfish salad, you skinny little insurrecto?" "Codfish salad!" he said with a deep sneer. "Who ever heard of it?" Outside, on the jumbled pavement of the street, an occasional two-wheel cart passed with deafening thunder, making one think of the overturning of houses. Down from the pale sky over the patio came a heavy odor of Havana itself, a smell of old straw. The wild cries of vendors could be heard at intervals. "'You'll not?' "'No. And why not? Codfish salad?' not by a blame sight. Well, all right, then. You are more of a pig-headed young imbecile than even I thought before seeing you come into Havana here, where half the town knows you, and the poorest Spaniard would give a gold piece to see you go into cabanas and forget to come out. Did I tell you, my son, Alfred is sick? Yes, poor little fellow, he lies up in the room you used to have. The fever." and did you see woodham in key west heaven save us what quick time he made in getting out i hear figtree and button are working in the cable office over there no and when is the war going to end are the yankees going to try to take havana it will be a hard job johnny the spaniards say it is impossible everybody is laughing at the yankees i hate to go into the street and hear them is General Lee going to lead the army? What's become of Springer? I see you've got a new pair of shoes. In the evening there was a sudden loud knock at the outer door. Martha looked at Johnny, and Johnny looked at Martha. He was still sitting in the patio, smoking. She took the lamp and set it on a table in the little parlor. This parlor connected the street door with the patio and so Johnny would be protected from the sight of the people who knocked by the broad illuminated tract. Martha moved in pensive fashion upon the latch. "'Who's there?' she asked casually. "'The police!' There it was, an old melodramatic incident from the stage, from the romances. One could scarce believe it. It had all the dignity of a classic resurrection. "'The police!' one sneers at its probability it is too venerable but so it happened who said martha the police what do you want here open the door and we'll tell you martha drew back the ordinary huge bolts of a havana house and opened the door a trifle tell me what you want and be gone quickly she said for my little boy is ill of the fever she could see four or five dim figures, and now one of these suddenly placed a foot well within the door so that she might not close it. "'We have come for Johnny. We must search your house.' "'Johnny? Johnny? Who is Johnny?' said Martha in her best manner. The police inspector grinned with a light upon his face. "'Don't you know Signor Johnny from Pinar del Rio?' he asked. "'Before the war, yes.' But now, where is he? He must be in Key West. He is in your house. He? In my house? Do me the favor to think that I have some intelligence. Would I be likely to be harboring a Yankee in these times? You must think I have no more head than an orden publico. And I'll not have you search my house, for there is no one here save my son, who is maybe dying of the fever, and the doctor. The doctor is with him because now is the crisis, and any one little thing may kill or cure my boy, and you will do me the favor to consider what may happen if I allow five or six heavy-footed policemen to go tramping all over my house. You may think—'Stop it!' said the chief police officer at last. He was laughing and weary and angry. Martha checked her flow of Spanish. There, she thought, I've done my best. He ought to fall in with it. But as the police entered, she began on them again. You will search the house whether I like it or no. Very well. But if anything happens to my boy, it is a nice way of conduct, anyhow, coming into the house of a widow at night and talking much about this Yankee and— 
For God's sake, Signora, hold your tongue. We—' "'Oh, yes, the Signora can, for God's sake, very well hold her tongue, but that wouldn't assist you men into the street where you belong. Take care, if my sick boy suffers from this prowling. No, you'll find nothing in that wardrobe, and do you think he would be under the table? Don't overturn all that linen. Look at you, when you go upstairs, tread lightly.' Leaving a man on guard at the street door and another at the patio, the chief policeman and the remainder of his men ascended to the gallery from which opened three sleeping-rooms. They were followed by Martha abjuring them to make no noise. The first room was empty, the second room was empty. As they approached the door of the third room, Martha whispered supplications, "'Now, in the name of God, don't disturb my boy!' The inspector motioned his men to pause, and then he pushed open the door. Only one weak candle was burning in the room, and its yellow light fell upon the bed whereon was stretched the figure of a little curly-headed boy in a white nighty. He was asleep, but his face was pink with fever, and his lips were murmuring some half-coherent childish nonsense. At the head of the bed stood the motionless figure of a man. His back was to the door, but upon hearing a noise he held a solemn hand. There was an odor of medicine. Out on the balcony Martha apparently was weeping. The inspector hesitated for a moment, then he noiselessly entered the room and with his yellow cane prodded under the bed, in the cupboard, and behind the window curtains. Nothing came of it. He shrugged his shoulders and went out to the balcony. He was smiling sheepishly. Evidently he knew that he had been beaten. Ah, "'Very good, signora,' he said. "'You are clever. Some day I shall be clever, too.' He shook his finger at her. He was threatening her, but he affected to be playful. "'Then beware, beware!' Martha replied blandly, "'My late husband, el capitan, signor, Don Patricio de Castellan y Valladolid was a cavalier of Spain, and if he was alive to-night he would now be cutting the ears from the heads of you and your miserable men who smell frightfully of cognac. "'Poor Dios!' muttered the inspector, as followed by his band he made his way down the spiral staircase. "'It is a tongue, one vast tongue.' At the street door they made ironical bows. They departed. They were angry men. Johnny came down when he heard Martha bolting the door behind the police. She brought back the lamp to the table in the patio and stood beside it, thinking. Johnny dropped into his old chair. The expression on the spy's face was curious. It pictured glee, anxiety, self-complacency. Above all, it pictured self-complacency. Martha said nothing. She was still by the lamp, musing. The long silence was suddenly broken by a tremendous guffaw from Johnny. "'Did you ever see such a lot of fools?' He leaned his head far back and roared victorious merriment. Martha was almost dancing in her apprehension. "'Hush! Be quiet, you little demon! Hush!' Do me the favor to allow them to get to the corner before you bellow like a walrus. Be quiet!" The spy ceased his laughter and spoke in indignation. Why, he demanded, ain't I got a right to laugh? Not with a noise like a cow falling into a cucumber frame, she answered sharply. Do me the favor! Then she seemed overwhelmed with a sense of the general hopelessness of Johnny's character. She began to wag her head. Oh, but you are the boy for getting yourself into the tiger's cage without even so much as the thought of a pocket-knife in your thick head. You would be a genius of the first water if you only had a little sense. And now you're here, what are you going to do? He grinned at her. I'm going to hold an inspection of the land and sea defenses of the city of Havana. Martha's spectacles dropped low on her nose, and, looking over the rims of them in grave meditation, she said, 
If you can't put up with a codfish salad, you had better make short work of your inspection of the land and sea defences of the city of Havana. You are likely to starve in the meantime. A man who is particular about his food has come to the wrong town if he is in Havana now. No, but, asked Johnny seriously, haven't you any bread? Bread? Well, coffee, then? Coffee alone will do. Coffee? Johnny arose deliberately and took his hat. Martha eyed him. And where do you think you are going? she asked cuttingly. Still deliberate, Johnny moved in the direction of the street door. I'm going where I can get something to eat. Martha sank into a chair with a moan which was a finished opinion, almost a definition, of Johnny's behavior in life. "'And where will you go?' she asked faintly. "'Oh, I don't know,' he rejoined. "'Some café. Guess I'll go to the Café Aguacate. They feed you well there, I remember. You remember. They remember. They know you as well as if you were the sign over the door.' "'Oh, they won't give me away,' said Johnny, with stalwart confidence. G -g "'Give you away? Give you away?' stammered Martha. The spy made no answer, but went to the door, unbarred it, and passed into the street. Martha caught her breath and ran after him, and came face to face with him as he turned to shut the door. "'Johnny, if you come back, bring a loaf of bread. I'm dying for one good honest bite in a slice of bread.' She heard his peculiar, derisive laugh as she bolted the door. She returned to her chair in the patio. "'Well, there,' she said, with affection, admiration, and contempt, "'there he goes, the most hard-headed little ignoramus in twenty nations. "'What does he care? Nothing. And why is it? "'Pure bread-in-the-bone ignorance. "'Just because he can't stand codfish salad, he goes out to a café. "'A café where they know him as if they had made him. "'Well, I won't see him again, probably, but if he comes back, I hope he brings some bread. I'm near dead for it. End of section 13